If you haven't had a chance to do the reading uh, that I have for, please do that. I'm going to cover most of it right now, but in kind of skips and jumps. So if you want to really see the detailed derivations of the, the equations I'm going to give, please look that up. Um, and then we'll do a quick example here just to show you how these solutions look a lot different than the solutions that we had seen um, before. So a CSTR is still a flow reactor. This is bizarre. I'm used to wearing my contact lenses, so I've got my glasses on. But there's this big gap right here between my eyes and my lens, and I can't see the globe, so I have like a triple chin trying to look down and see it. Uh, so generally a CSTR looks like kind of a mix between a plug flow reactor or a pack bed reactor um, and a batch reactor. Uh, at its simplest state, it's really just a batch reactor like this with a flow coming in and a flow coming out. Um, a CSDR typically will have a mixer in it. It's kind of there in the name, right? Continuously, continuous stirred tank reactor. So that little eight with a stick on the middle, that's supposed to be our, our um, mixer. I can also, I should probably try to do this maybe more in the design element of the course where we talk about combining the different reactors, give you an idea of what kind of reactions typically go on in a CSTR, what kind are typically go on in a uh, plug flow or a pack bed, um, just so you get an idea. Almost uniformly, which is great for us, um, CSDRs tend to be liquid phase. So most of the time when we're dealing with CSTRs, we're dealing with liquids. And so as a result, the little v going out is equal to the big v going, or the little v going in. Right, the volumetric flow rate of liquid going out is the same as the volumetric flow rate of liquid going in. We always draw these CSTRs as open, like there's no cap on the top of that thing. Um, but the, the liquid level, even if it really is open, which not very many of them are, uh, is level control. So there's some kind of a little meter on there that's keeping those things um, going. So the liquid level inside that CSTR also does not uh, change. Um, just like probably all of our plug flow and pack bed stuff, these are always going to be at steady state. So the only real truly time dependent ones that we've had to worry about are batch reactors. Um, these, again, will be along the lines of a plug flow and a pack bed in that they're steady state. And one parameter we've really never had to use before that gets used more often for a CSTR uh, is that space time um, or residence time, which was tau. Uh, we had briefly introduced this as just one of those other parameters that I can give you to try to specify the size of a reactor. Um, oh, let me plug in my microphone on the iPad. It should still be recording. Uh, it's just about to get better. I mean, I don't hear my voice more clearly clearly, given how bad it is right now. Anyway, um, tau is more of a parameter that's used in a CSTR uh, because the flow patterns inside a CSTR are more difficult to visualize than they typically are with like a plug flow or a pack bed, where you kind of just assume everything is moving in from the left and going out on the right, or right to left, whichever way you're going. Um, and so we use this residence time, whose definition has not changed from uh, the previous one, which is the volume of the CSTR divided by the volumetric flow rate. So that's a capital V, because it's got caps, uh, divided by a lowercase v, which does not have caps. The reason that we use this uh, so much more is if you were to try to track the particles inside a CSTR. If you've got a, um, a liquid level here, Ideally, you would like the concentration everywhere inside this reactor to be exactly the same, except for that very first point at the, the inlet. But in a real situation, that tends not to happen. Um, what you tend to get are areas, for example, down here or down here that can be dead zones. Right, if you're a particle and you make it down there, even though that paddle mixer is up there in the middle spinning around, I mean, think like a blender if you're, I don't know, does anybody in here cook? If you ever use a blender, it spins thing around. Um, I'm sure you've seen blenders before. <laughs> there are elements inside that blender, though, that are not moving at the same velocity as everything else, so they may not be well mixed. 
Um, you know, if you put peanut butter in there, you tend to get the peanut butter on the sides because it can't get swept off by the fluid flow. Those are dead zones. Um, you can also have like, the opposite of a dead zone in that a dead zone means something is there forever is called a short circuit. Uh, so you could also have a particle not jump over the liquid level, but sort of go right along the top um, and never really make it into that bulk volume and kind of come out the other side. We'll have some more tea time in this lecture than most lectures. Okay. Yes? Should the cyclone be eliminated if we choose a superior cyclone? Yes. Mm -hmm. However, the geometry of the reactor does have a strong influence on whether the dead zones are significant and how big they are. You could choose, for example, an absolutely terrible geometry. Um, or a more optimized geometry like a cylinder or a sphere or a capped cylinder or something like that. <coughs> so given that we have this difference in the amount of time that a particle spends inside the reactor, we need some kind of parameter that says, on average, how long do I spend in there? That's the tau. So the residence time in here has a more obvious interpretation for a CSTR than it really does of a, I don't know, I guess it's the same for a plug flow reactor. A more useful interpretation is that tau is the average residence time. And that's something that we didn't really have to use with a plug flow or a packed bed reactor because we assume it all kind of moved in a plug, right? It moved from one side to the other. We could calculate a velocity or a residence time if we needed to, but it wasn't particularly something that we had to worry about. Most of, actually, all of our CSTRs are going to assume that everything is called perfectly mixed. Um, the perfectly mixed assumption or perfect mixing is a very useful assumption. We do have plenty of ways to get around this assumption. In fact, they're even labeled in your, I think it's chapter 14 in your book. It's called residence time distributions. But at any rate, perfect mixing uh, says that the concentration of any species I inside reactor uh, is equal to the concentration of species I exiting the reactor. And that can seem a little bit weird, right? How did something come in at an initial concentration entering the reactor, and then it gets into the reactor and comes out of the reactor seemingly instantaneously at some new value. The reason is because we're kind of lumping all that time dependency inside that tau parameter if we ever need it. Um, it really did spend some average amount of time in there, so it had some time to react before it came out on the other side. But the mixer was keeping that concentration basically the same everywhere. Um, and so that's our perfect mixing uh, assumption. What that means is all we need to know uh, if we're worried about any rate parameters or I guess generally it's not just any of the rate parameters, but anything to do with concentration. Those are all going to be based on your outlet stream. This is how the CSTR is different from a plug flow reactor. In a plug flow reactor, a packed bed reactor, we watch that concentration all the way through the reactor, and we could plot its concentration all the way through the reactor. We can't do that with a CSTR because we assume everything inside the reactor is exactly the same as what came out. So that's really helpful because now we don't really need a differential equation to describe what happens along the distance or length of a reactor. All we need to know is what came out and what went in. Um, and as a result, we end up not needing, well, I just said it a minute ago, we don't need any differential equations, uh, which is, I don't know, good and bad. Um, I don't think the differential equations are that hard to solve in uh, MATLAB. I think some of these equations can be much more difficult to solve in MATLAB. Um, 
but they can also be worded much more cleverly for an exam, which is also nice. Uh, so with these general interpretations of a, a CSTR, the material balance simplifies quite a bit. Um, and so this derivation is one that I'm not going to go through in a lot of detail because your book does it. So just double check that reading um, that I was going to have you do there. I'll try to mute the mic while I drink my tea because that's I hate listening to other people eat. It's disgusting. Yeah. So the that mixing, the perfect mixing basically because of that mixer inside, you're able to assume that the conservation is the same as the conservation out. Yes. That that's the the assumption of perfect mixing. If you were worried about not being perfect mixing, then you would use what I mentioned before. I think in your book, it's like chapter 14 of residence time distributions. And you can adjust that tau to say, well, some particles actually spend more time in there than others um, and adjust the kinetic. Well, you don't adjust the kinetics. You adjust the material balance accordingly. Um, but it, it, we're never going to do anything like that, so don't worry about it. Anybody do, if you were, let's see. Even the transfer students, you wouldn't have done 120 yet, right? No? OK. It's an interesting com combination of control theory and reactor design, because they use a lot of the same um, analysis techniques for something like that. Now you've got me all distracted. It's such a fun topic. OK, so material balance on a CSDR. If you didn't already read ahead and see this, it's great. The volume of the reactor, capital V, is the difference of out minus in as a molar flow rate divided by the rate. That's it. There's no differential. There's no initial condition. There's no final condition. Um, no iteration. Well, actually, there's a ton of iteration to do. Uh, but that's it. If you have to use a. Uh, CSTR in order to have a multi-reaction system go on. This is generalized as well. So any species I coming in minus that species I going out divided by minus Ri. And you might ask, well, how, how come you got a minus on the bottom? Uh, for both species A and any other species, the signs will work themselves out because the flow rates will be different. So if something is a product, uh, its rate will be positive, and the term on the top um, will end up being positive. And, or, sorry, term on the top will be negative, the rate will be positive, so the negative and the negative will cancel out. So regardless of whether it's a product or a reactant, you always end up using that expression. If you happen to have a single reaction, you may have noticed we always derive these things in two ways. One in terms of like either a moles or a molar flow rate, and then another in terms of a conversion. You can also write this in terms of conversion. Again, mostly useful if you're worried about a single um, reaction. Not so helpful if you have multiple reactions. So that's the same thing for a single reaction. This one would be single or multiple. I don't know how clear your book made that for you. Pretty sure they gave you both of those. If you have a multi-reaction system, um, just like plug flows didn't change this, just like pack beds or uh, batch reactors didn't change this, you still need a net rate. So the net rate I is still equal to the sum over all reactions J of Rij. That part hasn't changed at all, which is, and it never will change, no matter what kind of reactor you have. Um, if you have multiple reactions, you always need a net rate term uh, that looks just like that.
And that's pretty much all there is to uh, material balance on a, a CSTR. Uh, we're going to look at an example because usually the, the path of solving these things is different. The reason that it's different is because this expression uh, is not a differential equation. Since it's not a differential equation, we can't use ODE 4.5 on it anymore um, because there's nothing for ODE 4.5 to solve. And so you're typically left with one of several approaches to solve these problems. Very often, these things can be solved with a calculator. Uh, obviously, the majority of them that you would ever solve on a, um, an exam would be a calculator. Uh, most of them in the homework that I'll give you will be calculator. Um, if you have not explored it yet, most of your calculators should have a solve function. <clears throat> oh, sorry, forgot to mute it. Uh, and that solve function can go through and solve a, a nonlinear equation pretty easily. Uh, if you don't have a calculator, get a calculator. <clears throat> if you have a computer nearby and you would rather use that than your calculator, um, you can also use, I'm going to call it Excel, uh, but any spreadsheet system can solve these things really easily. Usually the functions you need inside Excel, um, or I think Google Sheets calls it the same thing, um, are called goal seek. Uh, and then the last one, of course, if you do want to use MATLAB, uh, you better believe MATLAB can solve these things. Uh, there's two that you can use for MATLAB. One's called F0 that I had briefly mentioned the other day to help on your project. The other one is called F solve. Neither of which, well, actually, the F0 is not bad. Try F0 before you get to F solve. Um, if F0 can't do it, F solve can, but the syntax for F solve is not particularly, uh, I would call it user friendly. I don't think we're going to do anything in here that requires F solve. But at any rate, the, the techniques that each one of these are using are some sort of an iteration procedure to solve a nonlinear equation. Um, it's rare that you can solve these things analytically if we are asking for particular values. And that's why I'm going to do the example that I'm about to do, to show you that if we give you certain information, these things kind of just crank through like plug and chug. If we give you other pieces of information and ask you to solve for the other ones, that's when you have to back out and get like a calculator in Excel or MATLAB or something like that, um, simply because you're solving now a nonlinear equation rather than a, a linear one. So as an example, And I would say right next to this example, um, put that example from the book, because that example from the book is a good one. It's a little bit more of a, an example like how would this get worded in a way that's not worded by me. Um, I mean, if, I feel like all of my problems kind of sound the same as I'm wording them. Um, if you want to see an, a, a good example of another way to word these, kind of like those California PE exams. Uh, to me, those feel like they were written by somebody other than me, which is nice. Um, you should be able to solve them regardless of who writes them. So as an example, uh, find V for 90% conversion of A. Uh, if the residence time, tau, is equal to one minute. And obviously, I have to give you a little bit more information than that. So let's sketch our own little CSTR over here. So coming in are six moles per second of A. I don't know why the six is higher than everything else. Six. And it's coming in at. Um, Oh, sorry, I added an inert. 50 moles of I, I as an inert per second. The reaction that's going on inside here uh, is elementary. 2A goes to B. Uh, and the rate constant that we've got, K, 
will be 10 to the minus 2. And then it's got these weird units because of being second order. Liter per mole per second. Keep in mind that your units of tau um, do matter. It's not a dimensionless parameter, so it has units associated with it. Generally, they need to match, just like everything else. Um, so given that all of my flow rates are in terms of uh, seconds, and I have a tau in terms of minutes, um, we can use that as a requirement, or sorry, as an extra equation to solve the problem if we change its units to match everything else. Um, chances are we will always need to do that. Um, so in the, what would you call it, in the sense of doing the problem like I would normally do it if I were actually sitting down and solving this on paper, I would probably write that tau, the residence time, it's still equal to the volume over the inlet flow rate. And then I would just write that this is equal to 60 seconds. Just so that going forward, if I, if I ever need tau, I've already done the unit conversion. I don't have to think about it again. So since this is um, elementary, we know that RA is equal to KCA squared times CB. Or no, sorry, it's not reversible. Um, just KCA squared. And so we don't have to do a lot. Um, there's not a lot left in the material balance. You don't have to go over to ODE 4.5 or anything. You just plug that into the previous expression that we had. And the previous expression that we had was that the total volume V is equal to FA naught times XA divided by RA. Sorry, minus RA. Pro tip, if you're ever doing these problems and you calculate a negative volume, you have a sign problem. Um, it has been known to happen before. We do not have negative volumes. FA naught XA uh, divided by KCA squared, if we substitute our friend back inside there. Uh, and we can use all those expressions that we've already developed for flow reactors for CA um, in exactly the same way that we had for like plug flow pack bed. Again, because CSTRs are almost always liquid phase, uh, those end up looking a lot simpler, right? We typically don't have those nasty looking ones that have the thetas and the x's on the top and then the deltas, the ya naughts, the t's, the p's, and all that stuff on the bottom. We usually don't have that because that was for a gas phase reaction. Most CSTRs do not operate on gas phase um, fluids. They're all liquids. So those CAs uh, tend to look pretty simple. So on the bottom here, we would have K. Oops, we got to bracket that. CA naught 1 minus XA squared. And FA naught XA on the top. So all I did there was use that same expression for CA that we had seen for several other reactors and plug it in. The square is coming from the rate law, not from anything else. And so we need a couple of pieces of um, information here. If we look at the things that we do know, we do know FA naught, because FA naught was given to us as what's coming in as six moles per second. Do we know XA? Yes. That's one of the weird things about CSTRs is often you will get a specification as in tell me how big it needs to be for a particular volume. That's opposite of the way that we usually phrase things for plug flow or pack bed, which was more along the lines of here's how big the reactor is, tell me what the conversion is. These are usually opposite for the following reason that we will get to. So we know XA, we know this XA, we know K. Uh, we still need to figure out CA naught. Um, CA naught can come from that definition of the volumetric flow rate, which is FA naught over V naught. So that's a lowercase V naught, right? That's a volumetric flow rate. But we have one additional um, equation down there on the bottom left. The tau is equal to the uh, volume divided by the volumetric flow rate that we haven't used yet. We can use it here to give us some information on CA naught um, by replacing the lowercase V naught, the volumetric flow rate, uh, with 
essentially the volume divided by tau, um, because we actually know what that number is. So if we um, put all that back inside, what we end up with is the following expression. Uh, volume is equal to, on the bottom, k tau, what did I say next? Fa naught. Divided by v, 1 minus xa. All of that squared by uh, FA naught XA on the top. Why is that somewhat simpler? Uh, the reason that it's somewhat simpler is you have a, essentially a 1 over V squared on the bottom that you can pull out and send to the other side. You then, I think, have to, it would end up being what, a, a cubed root or 1 over V, something like that. At any rate, that's not a particularly difficult equation to solve for. V, if you rearrange it with a little bit of um, algebra. The V that I got, which again, feel free to check. Um, I can't check it right now because I don't have my calculator in front of me, but the V that I got was 2.4. But at any rate, you can solve that with a calculator, right? That there's no differential equation to, to be solved there. However, it's significantly more difficult if I had given you the volume of the reactor and asked you to solve for the conversion. The reason being you've got an xa on the top and a 1 minus xa squared on the bottom. That is a nonlinear equation in x that you would need to solve. Um, you can do it with like your graphing calculators, uh, but that's not the type of question that would show up for an example on an exam um, because it would rely on you having that tool. And I don't assume that all of you have that tool. So very frequently, um, you can find these worded in such a way that I'm asking you to tell me how big something needs to be for a particular conversion so that when you get to these expressions, x might show up in a bunch of different places in a pretty nasty looking way, but you'll probably know what x is, so it'll just be kind of a plug and chug problem. Um, and that's kind of a hallmark of CSTR problems. Uh, they're very easy to solve if you're going from a conversion to a volume. They're a little nastier to solve if you're going from a volume to a conversion. Um, if you're going from a volume to a conversion, then you usually need another tool um, to solve that nasty looking um, nonlinear equation. I think that was the only example I had. Yes. Uh, any questions on anything I did there? That's a pretty standard approach, so you'll probably find yourself, I mean, unless I made a mistake somewhere, which, again, not impossible, let me know. Um, but that's a, a fairly typical approach to one of these problems. Any CSTR problem, really. They also make great um, PE exam, professional engineering exam questions, for exactly this reason. They can start asking you things like, put them in series, put them in parallel, take half the flow and put them into one of the other ones, um, because so much of this simplifies to algebra. Especially when we get to our, our um, topic of energy balances on CSTRs, which we're going to cover. Let me make sure I don't have anything else scribbled down on my notes, because I don't think there's anything else. No. Um, you get a very some interesting behavior of CSTRs that you don't get in any other reactors, uh, which is facilitated, at least the observation of which is facilitated, because each of these are relatively straightforward to plot, um, because they don't involve differential equations. So we can plot them uh, without having to solve the differential equation. Um, we're at least going to introduce what those equations are, because they come up semi-regularly. We will see the odd behavior of those equations when we get to one of our design um, topics, which was multiple steady states, which can't happen in a plug flow or a pack bed reactor. But you can have essentially multiple solutions to this problem. Um, and your reactor can really run at multiple different steady states, depending on how you start it. Uh, if it's running, you can force it to shift to another steady state. Uh, there are. 
actually, let me double check. I think there was a YouTube video of somebody doing that, but I think it was actually a different reactor. Um, if I can find it, I'll post it. The energy balance on these guys. Um, doesn't look that much different from the plug flow, uh, except that we don't have to, the, the volume element that we took for a plug flow or a pack bed was a differential volume element. Here we're taking a volume element that looks more like a volume element from our batch reactor, which is the whole reactor. Um, so it ends up, again, not having any differential equations in it because it is given at um, steady state. All of the same conventions apply from the, the previous ones, so I'm not going to go over all of those, like, you know, work going in is positive, Q going in is positive, that sort of thing. Um, those still apply. Because we're at steady state, the accumulation term is still zero. We still have a Q dot. Um, shaft work is an interesting one for CSTR. It's kind of like batch reactors. If you ever need to worry about shaft work, it's probably going to show up on a CSTR or a batch reactor and not on a plug flow or a pack bed reactor. Um, again, mostly if you're dealing with something a little bit more viscous or a worst case scenario would be like a polymer um, whose viscosity is actually changing as you're reacting it, then you would definitely need to worry about that. Just like our previous reactors, though, we're not going to worry about it. Um, I should give you a problem where you do have to worry about it, though. It's not awful, right? You'll have some expression for work. It'll look like an expression for Q, um, but you use that instead of Q. If you use a typical shear work kind of form, you'll see it's like an order of magnitude or two smaller uh, than all the other terms. Anyway, the other thing that we do then uh, is sum up all of the enthalpy going in. So we take all our molar enthalpies, HI0, multiplying by our um, molar flow rates. and subtract off anything coming out, so Fi, Hi. These sums are over all species, not reactions. Um, and that should look pretty much the same as the energy balance that we saw for the previous ones. Um, the difference is how we apply it. Again, we don't need a differential volume element anymore like we did in a plug flow or a pack bed. We just apply that directly to the volume of the um, reactor. So we have zero. We'll keep the Q in there because we can uh, jacket these reactors just like we can um, anything else. And I'm only going to do about two of these steps and then list those same tricks that we would have used before. Actually, which one do I want to do? Yeah, let's do that one. Sum of Fi Hi zero. How do we approach this problem? We do it in the same way we would have done with the plug flow reactor. So we start plugging in things like stoichiometry. What do we know from thermodynamics? Um, what do we know if it needs to be, for example, a multi-reaction system? Where does that come in? So for example, if we wanted to work on that um, Fi term that's inside that uh, other sum, we would end up with something like minus the sum of Fa0 times Hi times theta i minus stoichiometric coefficient of i over stoichiometric coefficient of a times xa. So I'm just writing that one line to show you that this is the same approach we were using for the other three reactors. We're just going to start going through and picking apart each one of those values. The other equations that we need along the way um, are quite similar. So we have DHI is equal to CP of I DT. So if we can identify some deltas, or in this case, we could integrate things to get some differences. Um, so unlike the last one where we could leave these in deltas, uh, you could integrate them like that, and you'd end up with a difference. Um, that's one more tool that we would end up having to use here. And then, so let's see, this was thermo. 
We also need a material balance. Interestingly, there's two ways you'll see the material balance written. Uh, maybe not interestingly, confusingly. There will be two ways that you will see this written. Uh, they are both coming from this expression that we had already seen before, which is that the volume is FA naught XA over minus RA. This equation gets pushed into the energy balance in one of two ways, um, and they're both equivalent. FA naught XA is equal to minus RA times V. So sometimes you will see the energy balance written in terms of XA. Sometimes you will see the energy balance written in terms of RA and volume. The reason you can go back and forth is because of our material balance. Um, so don't think that those are two uh, remarkably different expressions. They're the same thing. T time. Does anybody watch Twitch? Do you guys ever see the uh, what, hydration bot show up in the chat reminding the streamer to take a drink every once in a while? If you don't watch Twitch, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so after you're all done with that, you end up with this. I can just imagine all the whispering I hear right now is people explaining to their friends what Twitch is. <laughs> Theta i, CPI, T minus T i, zero. Plus V times a quantity of R a. Actually, there's no reason at all for that to be a quantity. It'll probably just make things more confusing. Let's leave it on. Uh, RA delta H. So this part over here is the one that can sometimes change. You can also see this written as minus FA naught times XA times delta H. And those two forms are equivalent. Um, it just depends on kind of like what I had said in the previous problem, that I give you a conversion and ask for a volume. If I did give you a conversion and ask for a volume, you'll probably be using that gray version on the bottom because you know what x is. Or did I give you a volume and ask you to find a conversion? If you, do, if you know that, then you'll probably end up using the one on the top. Naturally, the one on the top tends to be a little nastier because it's got that rate term in there. Sometimes that's the one you've got to use, though. Um, and then as before, we still have that Q over here is minus UA times T minus TA. So that A is the area that we would have seen with a batch reactor, um, not a differential area element like the little A was that we saw for a plug flow pack bed. So when you see a capital A versus a lowercase a, and thankfully we finally have one of our 26 letters that looks different when it's capitalized versus not. Um, if it's lowercase a, that's only the one that's used for a plug flow pack bed. If it's capital A, that's always for batch or CSTR. Um, so you've got a capital A, so that must be going for a, a CSTR or a batch. Q dot, sorry. Here's the interesting thing, and we've got about enough time to show this. Um, we're not going to derive it because we're going to use it again in a couple of days. The interesting thing that happens with this equation, this being our working equation, the interesting thing that happens to that is what happens when it's adiabatic. When it's adiabatic, that Q term goes away, and we've got a 0 on one side. We've got a minus FA naught and a VRA delta H on the right-hand side. If we set those two equal to each other, so move that FA naught term over to the other side and set it equal to VRA times delta H, uh, then you will get the following. If the system is adiabatic, uh, then as always, our Q is equal to zero. If you rearrange that system and solve for x, 
Aren't you also proud that you can go back to high school now and explain to those little brats why solving for X is so important? Because they're always like, well, we never need to do this in the real world. I do it every day. I swear that was one of the reasons why I chose to teach college. It's because I can tell you guys stuff like that. And if I told a high school student that, I would hear from their parents later. <laughs> so you get the following. T minus Ti is zero. Oh, yeah, the pay is a lot better, too. I mean, it's not good, but it's better. This is a very special equation, which we haven't been deriving this every single time uh, that we've been doing stuff. Surprisingly enough, that pops up in a remarkable number of reactors. Um, there is some way to rearrange something to make it look like that. The great advantage of this is that it's linear in temperature. So there's no square on top of the T, there's no cube, there's nothing like that. The T appears in exactly one place. It's up in the, the numerator, um, and it doesn't have any, what, weird looking functions, sine, cosine, hyperbolic functions, or whatever. And so that's the, the joy of this equation, is that it's linear in T. Linear in T if what? There's kind of a big caveat there. There could be a ton of other T's. Where could the other T's be located? So the delta H could have a bunch of T's. So it's linear in um, T if delta H is constant. And then the CP's, right? Those are fourth order polynomials. Those have a ton of T's inside of them. Um, so also all the CPI's have to be constant. Over a decent temperature range, though, that's not a bad approximation because we're dealing with liquids. If this was a gas phase, this probably wouldn't come up that often because those can vary over many hundreds of degrees Celsius. Liquid reactors, though, tend not to vary by more than like 50 or 60 degrees because uh, if you vary it by more than that, the thing will boil um, and you don't want that to happen. So these are not terrible approximations, specifically for CSTR because they're liquid. The advantage that we get if we have something like that